Okay, I'm Jack Tate. A former undergraduate student at the College of Charleston. 1997 through 1998, and that's kind of strange since I'm 65 years old. Uh, and then I went to Havana with your Spanish program, but I did have a little education prior to that. So let's uh, just briefly discuss that. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on Baby Superstore, nor on my past, because I want to talk about my present, which is my life in Vietnam where I live now. I just visit the USA. Uh, basically, uh, I was um, born in Augusta, Georgia, moved over to Greenville, South Carolina at two years old, went to public schools there, applied to Harvard, got rejected, went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, applied to Harvard Law, got accepted. Went to Harvard Law, third year Harvard Law, March 12, 1969, nine o'clock at night. My wife at the time had a baby going to baby stores, and I just didn't quite feel like I was a lawyer. I started to say, I want to start something. Now, Harvard lawyers aren't like that. You know, I was very strange, but I got this message in my mind, and I put it on a legal pad. I was studying for my third year finals. It said, Carolina baby, Alabama baby, Georgia baby, Florida baby, all these baby stores. I mean, it's really quite bizarre, isn't it? But I was turned on by it just lit a fire in me. So from there, I knew I just couldn't jump and open a bay. I didn't have money for one thing, you know, and so I went ahead and passed the bar, became a South Carolina lawyer. I know I don't look like one, but I still am. Don't practice. Practiced two years while I was beginning to develop the concepts. Exactly two years later, I opened the first baby superstore, we called it Carolina Baby back then, in uh, Pleasantburg Shopping Center. Greenville, South Carolina. We did a half a million dollars the first year, and I still remember when my legal secretary, who'd moved over to the baby business, called me and said, Jack, we may have a little problem here. It was in early April, and the way that clothing suppliers used to be, that you have to pay everything by the 10th of the next month. And we had a lot of clothing, baby furniture and things. She said, I have kept running these numbers, and for some reason, we are going to owe on that day, April 10th, 1971, $200,000 more than we're going to have. I thought you needed to know that. <laughs> That's how we got started. Pretty rough. If we jump forward many years, 25 years later, we were doing a half a billion dollars in sales. We had raised $210 million in public offerings in nine months. And I started feeling like I felt at Harvard back then that I wasn't too happy with this situation because the company was getting bigger than I liked to run. I, we had 3,300 employees and I like to be, know, know everybody and be involved. Each person has a different kind of personality. I decided to sell the company to our worst competitor who we were really giving a hard time to, Toys R Us, pretty lousy company actually, but they, they bought my company and let me go free. I really didn't know what I was going to do. So that's where the College of Charleston came into the program. How it worked was this. I'd had some links with a man named Perry Woodside, I much admire here, and Judge Sanders, Zoe, Patty as well. And they began to see if they could interest me in uh, funding the Tate Center with matching money, I think, from the state. In any event, I went ahead and had done that, but I said, you know, I like the College of Charleston so much. Why don't I go to school there while I'm thinking about what I'm doing? I'll go back and be an undergraduate again and go to school just like I did at Chapel Hill. Start over. This time, I don't have to major in anything. I can do whatever I want to do. And so I got my, I applied to the College of Charleston, got accepted. Uh, maybe the president got me squeezed in here or whatever. And uh, <laughs> went, back to, went back to school. But I was not exactly the typical student on campus. There was a few differences. For one, I had a $4 million yacht out there at the marina, and that was my dormitory. But I, did, I had a girlfriend up in Greenville, and I really didn't have, want to stay here alone all the time. So I would commute with my Learjet back and forth from the College of Charleston to my classes. Now, before you think I'm some kind of big jet set guy, 
I really began not to like that. I had a helicopter, Bell Jet Ranger, which I had specced out and built, a Learjet, flew all the way into Iceland, Finland, went down to, to uh, Chile, and it all <coughs> over the world. But, you know, you don't own things. Eventually, they own you. I had had all, I'd had all kinds of um, success in the business, but, and my top person in the business was a woman named Linda Robertson. I had, she started as my legal secretary, and she went all the way up with me, and finally I made her the president of the company. Uh, one day, after we'd sold the company, it was 1996, we'd already done the contract, but we hadn't actually finished it. I was talking to Linda Robertson one day, and because we'd sold the company, we already had a, a more interest in personal things, and uh, I said to Linda, we almost never had an argument, it was too busy to do that, we had to focus on competitors, which we really didn't like competitors much. We wondered what they were doing in our business. In any event, I was talking to her, I said, Linda, I just have to ask you a question, why is it is that every time I have a girlfriend, you have a lot of critical things to say about her, I know she's not in love with me, so I just don't ask her, and then why is it that she always becomes your best friend when we're not dating anymore? I'm just confused about this. I, I said, if you know so much about women, why don't you introduce me to one? Now, Linda's a very strong woman. She said, well, I just might do that. That argument is the reason I'm in Vietnam today. Totally, radically changed my life. There's something that's popularly referred to as the butterfly effect. And that effect, whether you like it or not, is going to affect your life, determine who you marry, what job you get, a lot of your success. So I'll say to you that when you're in your 40s and you look across the table at your breakfast table and you have your son and daughter there and your wife, and you go back and figure out how you met her, you're probably going to find a butterfly there. That maybe you just bumped into each other around a corner, or you almost didn't go to the College of Charleston, you almost didn't take that class, you, however you met. Yet your whole life is now changed by something that could have easily not happened at all. And I think it's very important to nurture butterflies. You know, <laughs> you, you better recognize the butterfly when you see one because it can radically change your life in a positive way, or missing one might take you in a wholly different direction. In my case, it started with an argument. So about two weeks <coughs> later, Linda called me. She says, Jack, uh, you, I have an idea for you. I want you to go get your nails done. I, I said, I don't do that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't do my nails. Uh, sorry, how would you even come? She said, remember that idea I had about meeting a real nice girl? I think I found one. I said, for that, I'll go do my nails. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm flexible. So I come in. I was running a little bit late. And there was this girl named Kelly there, a Vietnamese girl, beautiful girl. She thought I was going to be Jackie. And so she, thought, she didn't know who I was because she thought Jackie, a girl, had an appointment with her. I said, I'm Jack. She said, well, you're late. You're going to have to. I can get you somebody else. I said, no, I'm going to wait for you. <laughs> well. <clears throat> Time went by, we fell in love and all that. And then, then we experienced a tragedy. And that is that when I was in Florida, about three years later, Kelly uh, died in an automobile accident. Uh, February 1st, year 2000. I'd already visited her, her family, so I knew the family. And I decided in that year, that, that uh, 100 days after death, they have a, a, a wake of a type. And I went over to spend time with her her mom and her sisters.